Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Come on. Okay. Ja, wir brauchen die NATO. Wir sind überall, von Lithuania bis zum Sahel, von Afghanistan bis zum Irak bis zum Libanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace, a podcast of the International Crisis Group. I'm your host, Olga Oliker, and I'm speaking to you once again from Brussels. And I'm your co-host, Hugh Pope, also speaking from Brussels. We are incredibly lucky to have here on the podcast today, Rose Gottemuller. Rose is a former Deputy Secretary General of NATO, the NATO Alliance, and she was in that role until just last year. Before that, she was the Chief U.S. Negotiator on Arms Control. She is currently a distinguished lecturer at Stanford University and a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. And we are going to talk to Rose about the changing transatlantic environment. So, Rose, thank you so much for joining us. It's really my pleasure. I'm delighted to be here, Olga, and also Hugh. So I wanted to start with the transatlantic relationship. We are recording this when Donald Trump is still president, but Joe Biden is president-elect. And I think there's a certain hope. There was certainly a certain hope when Trump was elected uh, among many allies that whatever he did, whatever he was, it would be temporary and then America would get back to normal. So will the presidency of Joe Biden return the transatlantic relationship to normal or has Trump actually been that abnormal? I think the Biden presidency is going to return essentially to a new normal. We won't go back to the past. That's all there is to it. But that is formed not so much based on the personalities involved, but based on the fact that we are all suffering from this global pandemic. And so a lot is changing in society, a lot is changing in our economies, and in our defense and security relationships, there are also inevitable changes. So I think it is important to bear in mind that we will have a new normal. And I know that Vice President Biden, President-elect Biden, is very keen to prioritize reestablishing links with our allies and a healthy relationship with our allies. He's been clear about that. His campaign has been clear about that from the outset. So I am hopeful that there will be uh, early on a vigorous effort at consultation, discussion with allies, both the NATO allies and also allies in Asia and elsewhere in the world, and an effort, again, to establish uh, good lines of communication and a better relationship. I'll put it that way, because there is a lot of confidence building that needs to be done at this time. So what does that look like? What is a new normal for the transatlantic relationship? There will be some abiding issues, I think, that a President Biden will be focused on, and one is defense expenditure. I know for all the countries in NATO and for all allies, again, because of the pandemic, it is going to be difficult to think about keeping defense spending numbers up. But I know for the U.S. administration, no matter who's in the White House, and this has been the case for 60 years, it is important that defense burden sharing is not only on the shoulders of the United States, or the defense burden is not only on the shoulders of the United States, but is shared among the allies. So that will continue to be a priority, I am sure, for President Biden. But at the same time, I do believe, and I should stress for your listeners right at the outset that I'm expressing my personal views throughout this podcast. I have no official role, and I wouldn't want to imply that. But I do believe that there will be a big effort, again, on outreach to the allies and on partnership with the allies, on getting allied views on what the priority should be going forward, and on thinking through together how to handle continuing challenges that are out there, whether it's the challenge posed by the Russian Federation, whether it's the challenge, continued challenge uh, posed by violent extremism and terrorism, or whether uh, it is emerging potential challenges such as a rising China. So I think there will be an effort to have a lot more solid, good communication and to hear what allies have to say and take their opinions into account. Do you think that there's been any change in the Allies' view of the United States after this Trump interview? I mean, for sure, we can expect more communication and probably continued pressure on defense spending. But do you think the Allies themselves are as committed to the alliance as they used to be? There's obviously an enormous confidence building task that will have to take place because, honestly, the Allies have had their confidence in the United States shaken 
in this period and shaken in profound ways because it has not always been clear that President Trump was committed to allied relationships, again, whether with the NATO allies or with allies in Asia. And he was quite tough on some of the allies. I know Berlin felt that way. And also Seoul, if we look at the Indo-Pacific, they saw some very tough bargaining to try to get them to spend more for the basing arrangements in the Republic of Korea and South Korea. So there's been pressure all across the alliance relationships and a real feeling of unpredictability, I think, about what is coming next. So there will have to be a great deal of work done to repair that. So one of the narratives that has gained strength during the four years of the Trump presidency in Europe is is that European autonomy, right? The idea that Europe has been too much in America's shadow, that Europe needs to have, you mentioned listening to the allies. Well, the allies need to have more to say when it comes to conversations with the United States, but also that Europe should be an independent power in its own right. What do you think of that? Do you think that is something that really is going to emerge? And will the implications be, if so? It's already emerging, Olga, and we've seen it coming for some time. President Macron in France has been particularly insistent that there should be a big investment by the European Union and by the European countries in their own defense, uh, with an emphasis on having the independent capacity and capability. That process is already afoot, Olga, and has been for some time now, uh, because uh Politicians in Europe, leaders like President Macron have said, look, we need to have our own independent defense capability and capacity. We can build it up in the EU. We should, as individual European countries, be building up our defenses independently for use in a European setting. Even a European army has been mentioned. Now, my view as NATO DSG, as the Deputy Secretary General, always was that it's fine if Europe builds its own defense capabilities, if the EU builds up defense capabilities, as long as they are available for NATO to use in its own mission and operations, that they NATO won't be shut out of cooperating with the EU on making use of defense capacity. And furthermore, that we have a good conversation going on about requirements and what the military requirements are. We can't have the European Union asking its member states for uh, one set of equipment and the NATO process, requirements process, asking the allies for a whole nother set of equipment. That will never work and will add to a lot of waste, I think, in terms of how defense expenditures go forward. So we need to be in close communications and working closely together. I always said what Europe does to build up its defense capacity can be good for NATO and is an aspect of positive burden sharing. So I don't think it's something NATO should be afraid of in any way, shape, or form. But it is clear that the Europeans are thinking now and thinking hard, if the United States is not always going to be there for us, what are we going to have to do for our own defense? Talking about the new normal and investment, I mean, obviously NATO was made a long time ago. Do you think it's time for investment in new capacities that are not typically thought of as part of NATO? For instance, dealing with pandemics or cyber warfare or engaging the next generation or perhaps even some addressing of the gender imbalance in, in military matters. Is this the kind of thing that NATO should be getting involved in or has it got a lot more basics to get fixed first? The basics are always there, Hugh, and it's a constant struggle just to ensure that NATO allies are buying the right kind of kit, buying the right kind of equipment and military, again, military weapons and uh, vehicles and all that kind of thing. So the basics are always with us. But NATO is also trying to wrestle with some of the new challenges that are out there. And you mentioned the pandemic. I I think that's a really good example because NATO, like the rest of the countries around the world, really stumbled at the initial stage uh, when the pandemic first broke out in the spring of 2020 and was slow off the mark. But by the time the June defense ministerial rolled around, NATO was ready with a proposal to establish an operation to handle uh, future pandemic challenges. And why is that important? Once an operation is established, it means the full force of NATO planning capability, military planning capability, is applied to the problem at hand. And in this case, it has led to some very significant 
readiness for the next stage of the pandemic, which we are in the midst of right now. And there are also special capabilities that NATO has in terms of a trust fund to build up supplies in advance for, again, tackling the next phase of the pandemic. So NATO is very adaptable. And that is why I think NATO will live and survive going forward, because as new challenges come up, it adapts itself uh, to the new challenges. And I mean, I think the NATO of today is not something that creators could have possibly envisioned. The missions NATO has undertaken over the last 20 years are not ones that creators likely envisioned. Is NATO prepared for the missions of tomorrow that we perhaps are having trouble envisioning? Is there a way other than trying to build that adaptability to make it more able and to make it survive or need it survive? Should NATO go away and be replaced by something else at some point? It's trying to look over the horizon. Hugh mentioned a moment ago new technological challenges such as cyber warfare. And again, NATO is trying to adapt as fast as it can. It established cyber as a domain of military operations a couple of years ago in order to be able to establish a new center for military command and ensuring that it's able to handle a cyber attacks coming at it in the midst of a crisis or conflict, heaven forbid, but a conflict and thinking about what kinds of tools it would have available to respond to such cyber attacks. Every day, of course, NATO has to handle the challenges of cyber attacks. Every big institution, particularly military institutions, is under 24-7 attack by bad actors in the cyber sphere. So that's something that goes on routinely. But in terms of thinking about the, the warfare challenges, of cyber technology, NATO's trying to get ahead of that curve as well. So that's an example, I would say, across the board. It is trying its best. The other major area it has been trying to tackle is the so-called hybrid threats. Sometimes uh, cyber threats are also hybrid in nature, but hybrid threats, they range much more widely, even to little green men, such as those who went into Crimea in 2014. So NATO is trying to think ahead in that sphere as well. And believe me, it's not easy to keep looking over the horizon. But I have a feeling that NATO will do its best and continue to do its best in that regard. I often think of hybrid threats as whole of government approaches used by adversaries or potential adversaries. But that means that they often do require whole of government responses. And NATO is an alliance of multiple governments. How good is it at integrating all of these various tools? It's a military alliance, but as you say, the threats and the challenges are often not military. That's a very good point, Olga, and NATO clearly is a defensive alliance. That is what imbues its every action, is the notion of being a defender for its member states against military threats. And you're quite right that the hybrid threats are with us in every every sphere of national activity these days. But NATO, it's an old saying, but NATO has to stick to its knitting. And so it really does try to stay in the defense and military space because, for one thing, NATO has relative few resources for the massive effort to ensure that its members are defended from attack. And furthermore, it is not in itself any kind of federal organization. And the nation states who are members of NATO, they have their own governments to handle the wide breadth of problems. Those member states of NATO who are also member states of the EU, of course, many more executive functions in the EU. But again, NATO stays out of that EU territory. It's a much focused organization and will continue to be so. War and Peace a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace, a podcast of the International Crisis Group, and we are speaking to Rose Gardemuller. Rose, talking about these very wide array of threats from bad actors, as you call them, outside is all very well. But today, inside NATO, there are some frictions, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean, where we see allies in the alliance taking different sides in Syria, in Libya, and in the East Mediterranean. We've even seen military exercises taking place very, very threateningly to each other. How do you think NATO NATO can get over this. NATO has always had frictions on the inside from its very first years. I like to remind people that there were tense times over some of the governing systems among the original NATO member states. 
For example, in Portugal, Salazar was in control for the first decades of Portugal's membership in the alliance, and that authoritarian regime was followed by others, including in Greece, military coups, Turkey, etc. So there have always been some difficult situations inside the governments of NATO member states to contend with. So I think that what NATO can do once again is focus on what NATO does best, and that is insist on its values, the values that are incorporated into the Washington Treaty, incorporating democracy and the rule of law, pressing those principles on all member states, and being very mindful of evolutions that are taking place in those member states over time. And indeed, member states do come out of these situations and move on to better times. And so that is something that NATO always works to encourage and will continue to do so. In terms of the specific crisis that's been faced in the Eastern Mediterranean, it's a good example of, I think, how NATO can encourage movement in the right direction. And that is that the leadership of NATO, the Secretary General, the military leadership and the command structure of NATO have been working very closely with the Greeks and the Turks to try to bring these two member states to the table, to have some technical talks to begin with, to work out ways to bring the temperature down and to address the crisis. And so NATO can play that kind of facilitating role, again, to encourage things in the right direction. But in the end of the day, it must stand firm for its own principles. It can speak out very clearly. And again, the leadership does. uh, But member states have their own sovereign governments. And that is sometimes the way things go not quite in the right direction. As we like to say, and as Secretary General Stoltenberg frequently says, we are an alliance of 30 democracies, and 30 democracies vote in different ways at various times. And so NATO must bear that in mind. Will NATO become an alliance of more than 30 democracies? (laughs) Well, the door is open. The Republic of North Macedonia joined NATO. At my time at NATO, Montenegro also joined. So still on the list from the Bucharest summit are Georgia, Ukraine, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And so the door is definitely still open to NATO membership. And do you expect all of those countries to become NATO members? Maybe not tomorrow, but I like to remind people if you stand outside NATO headquarters, there's a wonderful timeline etched in the memorial in front that shows the line from the original members back in 49 all the way up through when Spain finally entered in the mid-1980s all the way up to now when we have the newest member states entering in. So that's a 70-year history, and NATO, I'm quite sure, will be here for another 70 years. What if peace breaks out? I mean, NATO's mission has shifted. NATO's view of who the adversaries are has changed. For a while, actually, it seemed that peace had broken out, right, in the 90s. NATO stuck around. Does NATO have a purpose if Russia and NATO members find a modus vivendi? Does NATO have a purpose as the Europeans become stronger, as the Americans perhaps turn inwards? Is NATO the solution to the transatlantic security equation? I see NATO as having an abiding role, and you raise the example of when peace last broke out in the early 1990s. That was a period when we began to see increasing threats of violent extremism and terrorism, and in fact, a decade later, in September of 2001, we had the 9-11 attacks. So that is when NATO turned its purpose both to out-of-area operations, but also to the fight against terrorism. Sadly, I don't think that fight is going to end anytime soon. It would be wonderful if it did, but I don't see it ending anytime soon. And again, the enormous military capability and capacity that NATO represents to have 30 countries who are able to fight together in a coherent way, have interoperable capabilities, This is a good deal of future stability and security, I would say, for the world as a whole, not only for Europe. But I do want to emphasize that the center of gravity for NATO will always be in the transatlantic space, determined by its members in North America, that is the United States and Canada, and by the members on the European continent. I don't see NATO, for example, as NATO becoming a big actor in the Indo-Pacific. It will always have its center of gravity in the transatlantic arena. 
Ollie has talked about peace breaking up, but it doesn't quite look that way, does it? We seem to see actors in Ethiopia, in Azerbaijan and elsewhere, Turkey using military force as a way to settle things and actually doing so sometimes with some success. What does that say about the environment which NATO is working in, especially since we've seen in the last six, seven years, Russia really moving forward in Ukraine and even expanding elsewhere its influence? Does that mean that NATO is less of a deterrent or am I misunderstanding it? I think NATO has been... A- an effective deterrent on behalf of its member states, which is its overarching purpose. I was very impressed at the way NATO responded quickly to uh, the Russian incursion into Crimea and destabilization of the Donbass in eastern Ukraine in 2014. It began, Russia also began to press more aggressively against NATO borders. And within a very short time, NATO had formed up the so-called battle groups in the Baltic states and Poland. It did not take very long for NATO to put the those forces in place, and they are what we call a deterrent tripwire. Russia knows that it is facing the full force of the alliance if it impinges on the territory of the Baltic states or Poland. It is facing all of the allies who are deployed in those battle groups. Now, of course, people say those battle groups, they're only a couple thousand service people each. You know, what's that going to do? Well, the point is they are a deterrence tripwire and they have to be backed up by effective reinforcements. So that is what NATO has concentrated on next, building up its reinforcement capability and capacity, and it will continue to do so. So Here we're back to that theme that NATO is very adaptable. And I think the NATO response to Russia's aggression in Ukraine is an excellent example of how it was quick on its feet to ensure that its deterrent uh, purpose would be met if need be. So speaking of Russia, Rose, I can't not ask you, you were America's negotiator on the New START Treaty. The question of that treaty's future is uncertain, to say the least. What do you think? Will New START be extended and will there be a follow-on treaty? Or you read a paper on this, right, on the future of arms control in the Washington Quarterly published a month or so ago. What happens? Do we get to keep New START and what happens after? President Trump was not a big fan of New START, but even his administration agreed and decided that it should be extended for one year. And that was the agreement that was reached with President Putin in the closing months of the Trump administration. I believe that it's very, very important to extend the treaty for five years, as is permitted by the treaty. It was negotiated so that it could be extended for five years without any difficulty. It does not, for example, have to go back to the U.S. Senate for another ratification process. It can simply be extended for five years. Why is this important? For one thing, one year, as I found out, trying to negotiate and get new start into force, It's impossible to do it all in one year. It's impossible to do both the negotiations and then the process in the U.S. Senate in one year. And so that is why I think it's really, really important to extend for five years so you have adequate time to negotiate. But also, and for some of your listeners, this may not be an especially palatable message, but the U.S. is embarking on a modernization of its nuclear triad. It's a judicious modernization that will be kept under control, under limits, by the limits of the New START Treaty, but it is going to unfold over the next 10 years. I think having a predictable and stable environment in which that modernization can take place should be an important national security priority for the United States, and that is why I have been arguing for a full five-year extension to give the United States predictability and stability during its modernization process for the nuclear triad. So on that note, I think we are out of time. But Rose, thank you so much for joining us. Listeners, you might want to check out Rose's full article in the Washington Quarterly. It's the fall issue, and it's called The Future of Arms Control. And I think you can't get a better source of insights and analysis on arms control than Rose Gottemuller. So if you want to understand what has happened and what could happen yet, you should absolutely read it. But in general, Rose, just thank you for joining us. It was truly my pleasure, Hugh, Olga. Great to be with you. You should also be following Rose and her work. Uh, She's on Twitter. She's at Gottemuller. And for more on Crisis Group's work on the challenges facing NATO's member states and the many conflicts and crises that they are actually involved in, do check out our website, www.crisisgroup.org. You should also follow Crisis Group and Hugh and me on Twitter. Crisis Group is at Crisis Group. Hugh is at Hugh underscore Pope. And I'm at 
Olya Olaker. You can also check us out on Facebook and Instagram, where we are also at Crisis Group. And please do feel free to tweet about us and what you like or don't like about the podcast. We will pay attention and uh, we will listen. If you're listening through iTunes, we'd really love it if you could leave us a rating and a review as well. And War and Peace is a partner in the Europod network of podcasts about Europe. Check out some of the others. So a big thanks to producers, uh, Bull Media, and to Rebecca Zerun Asifa, who makes sure Oli and I know what we're doing every time we record one of these sessions. And our biggest thanks, as always, to you, our listeners. Looking forward to chatting with you once again in a couple of weeks. Goodbye. Goodbye. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.